Hello and welcome to the Roto World Baseball Show. I'm your host, Eric Smolski, joined as always by my co-host Scott Pianowski. Scott, it's Patriots Day. We've got 11 a.m. Eastern Time Day Baseball going on. It's a beautiful thing. Um, as somebody who grew up in New England, I know the joy of that holiday where a lot of people just don't work and you know they, they watch the marathon, have a couple of adult beverages, and watch a baseball game in, in one of the all-time great baseball parks. So uh, a time to be celebrated. Hopefully the Red Sox can get a win. And uh, yeah, we're, you know, we're getting a couple of weeks into April, man. Um, you know, stats are starting to mean a little bit more. I'm starting mm-hmm. to cut people like Jose Abreu. That, that felt good today. I wrote about that for Yahoo. Um, I don't want to tell you who I added. You're going to laugh me out of the room. But um, <laughs> yeah, we're, uh, you know, fantasy baseball is, uh, is, I don't know about you, Eric. I know they say you're not supposed to look at the standings until May and all that. I, I look at the stand. I'm, al- I'm always trying to figure out what my team needs and what my team has and doesn't have. And I know that. While there's nothing definitive from a two week sample, I'm never going to be a wait wait for proof guy. If you're in a competitive league, wait for proof is not going to be a good fancy strategy. Um, I look, I don't overreact. Um, I, I I look just to see. I think there's a difference between like really focusing on your categories and um, ignoring blatant holes right so like if i'm not performing well and say stolen bases but i have guys on the team like nico horner who's not stealing bases but like i believe he will steal bases i'm not going to overreact because i'm i'm doing poorly in the category but if i'm doing poorly in the category and i just don't have talent that should produce that i feel like i am really weak somewhere it's not sit on your hands and do nothing until may it's don't overreact Right. Um, you know, we'll talk about this a little bit later. We're going to get into some news and notes and then some of the, you know, the kind of trendy ads and drops. Um, but when I did my Sunday column, um, waiver wire column for NBC Sports, I got a lot of like, should I drop Cody Bellinger? Is it time to drop Bryce Harper? Is it? It's like, no, it's not. Somebody right? wants we- to tra- First of all, you can always trade guys like that. Yeah, you know, yeah. if, if, you're, if you, you want to get out of the Harper or Bellinger business, which I'm not saying you should, right. with Harper, I would like strongly urge you to wait that out. With Bellinger, yeah. you have if you ever even think about dropping a guy like Bellinger, you have to try to trade him. Right. There's certain right. players that you, you won't be able to trade, and you can't be afraid. Like as I mentioned, I dropped Jose Abreu in a league. It's a 15 team league. He'll be added in that league, and I have to be okay with the, the fear of, sure. oh, he's going to be added by somebody else, and he's going to be great for them, and I'm going to feel lousy about it. But Jose Abreu wasn't good last year. Jose Abreu is 37. I, I think this comes right from Roto World. He's hit the ball hard once all season. He's got four yeah. singles and a double. It, they have a really interesting first-base prospect who's hitting a home run every freaking right. day, it feels That's like. I was going to say, it's interesting that Loperfito, Joey Loperfito yeah. is the guy that Scott's talking about. He is an outfielder that they were like, oh, let's, let's let you play first base. So that like that signals a little something, right? This is a guy who is a second base outfield prospect who is crushing the ball in AAA. And the Astros said, let's give you reps at first. And then you look at the Astros lineup at first and you see what Abreu is doing and you just put the pieces together and you think, you know, he might not be long for this lineup. Um, real quick, I did talk to some prospect guys on, on Twitter. We had a back and forth on Saturday about Lo Profito just because you brought it up. Um, the expectation from a lot of prospect type guys is that he is like a Jack Suwinski type where he's got really good power. He runs high strikeout rates. Those high strikeout rates tend to be because of a lot of called strikes, not a huge amount of swing and miss. So there's a potential that if he got a little bit more aggressive um, in the zone, he wouldn't strike out as much. However, part of the reason he's hitting so many home runs is he's waiting for pitches that he can drive. So yes, he does get behind in the count and yes, he does strike out, but he also really gets a hold of the pitches he swings at. So it just, if you are interested in stashing Joey Loperfito, if you're interested in taking advantage of the, the slow, the slow start by Jose Abreu, that is the profile you're looking at. You're not looking at a guy who's going to hit, you know, 280 with really good power numbers. Let me say um, one more thing to put a cap on this about about not waiting for proof and trying to connect dots early. Okay, and we're not a victory lap podcast, but I'll I'll give us a victory lap here. About a week ago, maybe ten days ago, we were talking up Colton Kowser, who was eight percent rostered in Yahoo, saying, "Look, Austin Hayes isn't hitting." Colton Kowser was the fifth pick in his draft class. It just seems like a matter of time before Colton Kowser gets his chance. They've had a lot of lefty starters early in the season. Maybe that's why Kowser hasn't been playing that much. Well, since then, kowser has gone ham the last week, and he's gone up to 76% rostered yeah. in, in Yahoo. And you and you, this was more you than, than me. I was probably just kind of backlining you on this. But 
Um, I got in on Kowser when maybe he was 15 or 18% rostered. I got him in a few leagues. Now, I mean, if you got him over the weekend, you had to maybe spend a lot of fab or elbow people out of the way, or maybe you're trading somebody good for him. Uh, the idea, if you can, is to try to get in before there's a big rush. Again, when he was 8% rostered, it might have made sense. It's, I understand some people might have needed to see a little bit while well, he hit two home runs on Thursday. That's it. Like you drop sure. everything, pick him up right then and there. Right. It shows you how much the landscape can change on a player and the perception can change on a player. And it wasn't that hard to see. The guy had a pedigree. The guy in front of him wasn't hitting mm -hmm. the roster. The schedule had been bad for Kowser to play early, but he was going to get a chance. And even when he was starting to pop, that was a little bit screen because Jackson holiday was around and he was kind of the hot story. So right. um, I hope a lot of people were able to get in on Kowser when it was cheap because it's not cheap anymore. And it's probably not even available to most people anymore. And I wasn't as much as I should have because the this not this past Sunday, but the Sunday before, I put a tweet out. NBC Sports even retweeted it uh, early in an earlier article that I said, if you don't have any pressing needs in Fab, now might be the time to stash Colton Kowser because of Austin Hayley, you know, all the stuff you just said. I added him in one league, and then in three of my other weekly waiver leagues, I didn't add him. I, I took some chances on like, you know, Trevor story was hurt. So I was like, oh, I'll, I'll add another middle infielder because I don't know if I, I might need this depth, whatever. Mm -hmm. um, I didn't add Kowser. I didn't expect him to go as nuclear as he did. I put in very aggressive bids for him last night. I still didn't get him anywhere. Um, and it might be a situation where I'm really kicking myself because, you know, again, you, if we reacted when I said, may, hey, maybe we should react. I would have had far more shares at lesser cost. Now, if you don't react, like I still put bids in on cows. Mm -hmm. I, I, I'm not too prideful to say, hey, I didn't react when I should have. This guy's going off. He's going to cost a lot of money, but I shouldn't. I'm not just going to wash my hands of that and be like, oh, well, I guess I'm not going to get him. I'm going to I'm going to try. Right. And it's also important to remember as you're talking about this idea of like react. You sh you have spots on your roster that you can churn and i really want to caution you against cutting guys who you spent even like top 200 picks on unless there is an injury or a clear playing time change like i got in a back and forth with somebody on on reddit in this the comments to my article where he was like why wouldn't i cut nick castellanos and i was like well he was like an 11th round pick in in 12 team leagues it's been less than three weeks he is somebody who we've seen has a history of production even if if you and i both were not like really high on him coming into the year it's a little early to cut him and the response was well he was an 11th round pick so he's my 11th best player so i have no reason to hold on to him and i just caution people against reacting like that so early in the season it it hasn't even been 3 weeks right some of these guys have less than than 60 plate appearances i know that a, an 11th round pick doesn't feel like it was a really high pick for you but in the grand scheme of things that that's a pretty sizable asset to spend in the draft to cut somebody 3 weeks into the season for poor performance Right. There's generally we talked about this before the season started. There's no clear marker. Right. There's no like, hey, anybody after the 17th round. But there is a part in your draft where you knew you moved from guys who had, you know, a little bit more stability or guys you had a good feeling about to guys who were just taking flyers on. Mm -hmm. And that part in your draft will shift. I, I guarantee you that part was not the 11th round where you were like, ah, oh, whatever. I'm just going to throw a dart. Right. That That's not the 11th round. So just. Take a deep breath. Pause. It's a long season. You can cut some guys at the bottom of your roster. We'll give you some guys later that you could probably move on from. But some of the hitters in particular who are just struggling to start the year, maybe put them on your bench. Pick up somebody who might challenge them. But you don't have to just flat out cut them so early. Yeah, there's definitely you're cutting from the bottom of your roster. And once that part of your drafts switches to where your picks are more speculative in nature. Nick Castellanos is not a speculative player. He's a player who has a track record. I know he's probably a back nine player or if you're Augusta national second nine player, but still I, he deserves a benefit of the doubt. And unless there's something comes out that he's hurt in some way, or, you know, that maybe the calculus changes, I would not, I would move on from somebody like maybe Tristan McKenzie velocity's down. He's got more walks and right. strikeouts. He's looked awful in all three of his starts because, you know, he, coming off a major injury, hardly pitched last year. You probably drafted Tristan McKenzie in a wait and see round. Uh, Mike Soroka was a guy that in a deeper league, my partner and I drafted sure. as a wait and see. He's looked terrible for three starts. 
I, I think it's perfectly fine to move on from him, understanding that sometimes you're going to cut a guy, he'll do it for an opponent, and that really stings. But if you never get caught bluffing in poker, you're playing too conservatively. If you mm-hmm. never make a cut that you regret in fantasy baseball, you're playing too conservatively. So there's my two cents on that. Yeah, so we're going to get to the news and notes, and then Scott and I will go through some of the guys that were most added or dropped um, in Yahoo Leagues this weekend just to kind of let you know where we stand on them. We're going to try to go through some of this uh, quickly so we can get to as many names as possible. Uh, Since we last recorded, Bobby Miller was put on the IL with a shoulder injury. The Dodgers have said that the MRI came back clean in in terms of like there were no tears or anything like that. There was just some inflammation, and they said he's actually going to start throwing again next week. So obviously... You know, there is some concern, but you're not cutting Bobby Miller. You should be putting him on the IL. If you don't have the, an IL spot, you should be keeping him um, on your bench. I know we've heard, hey, it's no big deal. And then it winds up being a big deal. Is this a situation where you're not going to cut Bobby Miller, but if he comes back and has a good couple of starts, if you're in a trade league, you might look to unload him and just not have to worry about it for the rest of the year? Or is he so good that you just want to keep him? I, I like that tack of him coming back and then maybe trying to get just get away from the Dodgeritis, right? I mean, we know how deep their rotation is. It sounds like Bueller might just need one more rehab start. Mm-hmm. Eventually, they're going to get Kershaw back. I man, James Paxson had a weird start. He walked eight guys last night. Their rotation has like nine or ten viable guys, and of course, you mm-hmm. teams know now. You could you have to assume that there's so much. It's like. Retail stores know that a certain amount of the products on on the shelves are going to get stolen. You know, I, I know it's a horrible analogy, but you just <laughs> you just know that you have eight or nine starting pitchers, and like a third of them are going to get hurt. Maybe half of them. It's just it's the climate we live in. But Miller's most capable of being the best pitcher on the staff. That's how much I love him, and, and look yeah. at all the talent around him. You know, Glasnow's got off to a great start. They obviously made a huge investment in the free agent market with Yamamoto. Uh, Kershaw is great whenever he pitches. You just know it's going to be eighty to one hundred innings. Mm-hmm. I want to wait. I, If I'm going to trade Bobby Miller, which I'm not against doing, I want to trade him from a position of strength. And at some point later this sure. season, you'll have that. Yeah, and just so we're clear, we're Scott and I are talking about this in like a redraft format. You shouldn't be trading Bobby Miller in a keeper league or a dynasty league or anything like that. It's the, just the possibility that you could um, – you know, you could move him if he looks really good when he comes back. Um, speaking of coming back, the Astros have two pitchers on the way back. We know that Justin Verlander is coming back. He is starting on Friday, um, gets a nice cushy landing spot against the Nationals. Um, and Framber Valdez will play catch tomorrow on Tuesday. Um, he said he did not have an MRI. And this is according to Chandler Rome, the Astros beat writer. And Valdez said he doesn't think he'll need a minor league rehab start. Uh, But a lot of this is contingent on how he feels after playing catch on Tuesday. So he'll play catch on Tuesday, and then presumably he will uh, move on to mound work and throw off the mound. And if he doesn't experience any health setbacks, um, maybe the Astros give him one minor league start because it's probably smart to, uh, but they don't have to. So... What are your thoughts on Verlander and, and Valdez right now? It's so hard to know what to expect from Verlander. He's already turned 41. He hardly pitched last. He hardly pitched effective last year. Although I guess his Houston numbers weren't that bad. Um, I didn't draft any of them. Um, mm-hmm. Yeah, I know he's a horse and everything. I know his career so so strongly resembles Roger Clemens. Right? I mean, he he drafted by a team. He's great. He has a little bit of a dip. They end up trading him, thinking, you know, there isn't that much left here. I mean, the Red Sox walked away from Clemens. They didn't offer him much of a, of a deal. And then, of course, he won the Cy Young the next year with Toronto. But uh, he winds up in Houston, much like Clemens wound up in Houston at the end in his 40s. I, if I were ranking starting pitchers right now, I, I, he'd probably have to be shoehorned into the top 40, but he'd be like 38 or right. 37 or something. Like, I feel like if I was in a redraft, Eric, and I mean, we, we will do the Friends and Family League as a redraft at some point either later this month or in early May and make a piece of content out of it, you'll be invited to that league. But I think somebody would want Verlander more than I would. Yeah, I I have no problem putting him on your bench. Um, I think especially in this starting pitcher market, guys who have that kind of track record and pitch for Houston um, are worth adding. I don't, I wouldn't expect old school Verlander. Uh, Valdez is another one. Obviously like this doesn't change anything. You, you were keeping him on your IL or on your bench anyway. Hopefully he's right. And he doesn't need, that time um and then that'll be an interesting situation for the astros because i think when verlander comes back spencer Aragetti is is going down i think we we understand that um if valdez is coming back in say two weeks three weeks um 
you know, then the Astros will have a choice between JP France or um, a guy we're going to talk about later in one of the most dropped players um, in Yahoo leagues, which was Hunter Brown. Um, so that will be something to keep in mind. Uh, we got good news for the Cubs. Jamison Tyone is coming off the IL. Um, he is going to start against the Marlins in the middle of this week. The Marlins are an offense that um, I wanted to pick on, and that was even before they put Jake Berger on the IL with an oblique injury, and we'll come back to him in just one second. Um, I personally am in on, on Tyone. Um, I wrote about him a lot. Nick Pollock and I talked about him a lot as a guy going outside of the top 300 in drafts that I thought could have a, a good year. Jamison Tyone spoke a lot before last year about how he changed his pitch mix heading into last year, and it took him until about the second half of the season to really feel comfortable with the new pitches, the new grips, having comfort and stuff like that. Um, and actually, it was pretty interesting. Eno Saris and Nick Pollock on their podcast, The Craft, put out the idea that pitchers with new pitches actually get better with those new pitches in their second year throwing them because they have another year under their belt and they get more comfort with them. And then I looked back at all the guys I covered who had new pitches last year, and I looked at how they were performing on those pitches so far this year, and 80% of them are like above average stuff plus grades, above average swinging strike grades. Um, so it is there is something to – looking at guys who made a lot of changes the year before, and then they're getting them in that second year. They're having those changes. I do think that applies to Jamison Tyone. Um, I'd be looking to add him in most places, at least put him on your bench. He's got a good matchup here. Um, I don't think he's going to go more than like 65, se like 70 pitches, 70, 75 pitches in this one, based on what he did in his last rehab, rehab start. So you don't, it's not a must start. Um, I think this might be the end in the rotation for Ben Brown. Um, and then when Justin Steele comes back, it'll be a battle between, you know, Jordan Wicks and, and Javier Assad. Um, anything else you feel like adding on, on Tyon, unless you have like any real pushback on him? Yeah, I, I agree with you. The, the conclusion would be the same. I, I just want to note that the second half stats, you talked about him having a spike in the second half, 3.70 ERA, 1.17 whip. That feels to me kind of the, what Jamison Tyon is. And sure, I, I want to make it clear that's a playable absolutely playable pitcher in certainly 15 teams, certainly 12 team. You, you would probably play him most of the time in a 10 team league with stats like that. That's good enough. And if any of these gains he made in the second half, or just, you know, just a cycle going in the positive direction, if that leads to any improvement, as you talked about with Nick and, Eno, the stuff they were talking about, then maybe he could be a 340 guy with a 1.13, 1.14 whip. The bottom line is that's the type of pitcher who should be rostered. In if we assume if we assume a twelve team lead with these discussions, you have to season them the taste. I think Tyon should be rostered everywhere. Yeah, and another guy who I think is maybe I have a, a, a little bit behind Tyon is Michael Lorenzen, who's coming off the IL for the Rangers. He's going to take the spot of Cody Bradford. Uh, Cody Bradford, who had looked really good in the Rangers rotation, is now in the IL with a back injury. Lorenzen is a guy um, who I if you look at his career numbers, there's a lot of like people commenting, oh well, you know. He's only thrown over 100 innings once. Well, yes, but he's only been a starter for two seasons. Um, he threw 97 innings in 2022 and battled some injuries through 153 innings last year. 418 ERA, 121 whip. He has a, an 18% strikeout rate. He is not a strikeout pitcher. But this is a guy who looked solid, if unspectacular, as a starter last year, even though we know he did throw a no-hitter, who's going to pitch in a pitcher's park, in a really good offense, there's a chance that Michael Lorenzen is a guy who goes five or six innings, gives up two earned runs, strikes out four, and if you're in a deep league and, and gets wins because he's pitching for the Rangers, and if you're in a deep league, I think that is a viable starting pitcher. If you're in a 12-team league, I think that is a streamer depending on matchups is my take on Lorenzen. You like him more than I do. I, what's hard to reconcile with Lorenzen is he doesn't have a great strikeout rate, which I'm fine with. But when guys don't strike out a lot of batters, I want them to have a microscopic walk rate, and he doesn't. He actually mm -hmm. has a kind of a, a league average walk rate, really low strikeout rate. It's weird because you see him on the mound. He's six foot three. He looks like somebody who should be blowing people away, and then he doesn't. As you mentioned, he threw that no hitter last year, and then he backed it up with like three or four very mediocre starts after that, which is not uncommon for somebody who out of nowhere throws a no hitter. 
he would have to play his way onto my roster. And I understand yeah. that, you know, that means that in some leagues I'm going to get beat to the punch where people are being proactive and I'm okay with that. The Rangers do have a good backdrop. There are certainly some soft landings. So they'll get some Oakland starts. We like that, but I, I see your case on the runs and you like him more than I do. I'll be a wave behind you where I consider picking him up. Um, has Jose Budo played his way onto your roster? Looked good um, against the Tigers when he was called up earlier in the month as part of a double header. Um, and then he got called up to take the place in the rotation of, of Julio Tehran. Uh, six innings, two hits, no runs, nine strikeouts, mm -hmm. and one walk against a pretty solid Royals lineup this weekend. Um, Tyler McGill is nearing a return for the Mets, but he hasn't been great. I feel like Tyler McGill could be uh, a bullpen arm. Are, are you in on Jose Budo, or do you think that it, there's just too much uncertainty right now? I'm interested. He was quasi-playable. He was a little bit lucky last year, but quasi-playable with a 3.64 ERA and a 1.33 whip. He made seven starts for the Mets. And you mentioned, I mean, four walks, 15 strikeouts in 12 innings. That certainly moves the needle. It's not like Tehran was blocking him at all. I mean, the Mets are going to pitch whoever they think is better. And right now that looks like Budo. Unfortunately, in leagues where I could have used him, I made, I thought, were competitive bids. I didn't win any of them. So I I guess selfishly, I'm kind of hoping it doesn't work out because I'm going to be right. probably sitting it out where I could use them. But this is what we're trying to, this is what, what pitching is. This is what pitching analysis is. And in and, and deeper leagues, you're trying to, once you see some plausible upside, you have to consider a move. And I think Budo has certainly shown it. Yeah. And I will uh, encourage people on Wednesday, my mixing it up column comes out at NBC Sports and I will have Jose Budo on there. Um, he's added a little bit of a sweeper. Uh, he's added a sweeper this year and he's tightened up his older slider to be kind of like a gyro slider. Um, and then he also has changed his release point on his fastball, which has allowed the fastball to play up a little bit. So there are some changes going on here which support the stats, and those are always things that we like. I, to I just wish he didn't get the Dodgers this week. I mean, yeah, anybody I, but them, right? I mean, the Braves, I guess, would be bad too. But and that's and but that's a perfect example of your hey, you didn't get Budo this week. And I, I told people to maybe stash him and not play him this week. But if if somebody picked him up and plays him against the Dodgers and if he doesn't have a good start, Budo is the type of guy that could get dropped because somebody doesn't think he's really good. He has a bad start against the Dodgers. Oh, is he going to lose his spot? So when you miss out on guys, I always just like to take a note or write it down somewhere that like guys who I think could get back on the wire – or if you're in a trade league, guys whose value could lower to the point where you might be able to get him back again. And not only are you speculating on guys who might get dropped, literally, it's especially in leagues that have periods where you pick up guys, where it's not just a free-for-all, every time the fab is run in one of my leagues, I audit that thing. And I want it for yeah. a, few, a few different reasons. I want to look at the bidding patterns of different teams. If people land on a certain number, it's, just, it's a little bit of poker there. But I'm also looking at who got cut. Because what's, mm -hmm. what's happening now, Eric, especially this year with so many early injuries, right, is people are filling up their IL spots, and now they're cutting players they don't want to cut, but they have to because they have right. immediate needs and the season's gone on. And you know, we talked about whether or not you should look at the standings. I know you really shouldn't look at them with any gravity, but some people are going to. People are going to start doing things maybe they shouldn't, cutting players they don't want to. So just make sure. You, don't, you can look at it you know, for a minute. You can look at it for 15 minutes. It's up to you. But don't be caught holding the bag thinking, oh my God, that guy was dropped. I didn't realize that. You have yeah. to audit the job. Even if you just eyeball them for a second, it'll take, it'll take you 15 seconds. Just look at everybody who was dropped because we're getting at the time of the year where players who shouldn't get dropped, as you talked about, people are thinking about dropping Cody Bellinger. That's crazy. I guess you would probably notice something like that. But even like the Nick Castellanos conversation, players who shouldn't get cut are going to get cut. And I want you to not be taken by surprise when they're available the next bidding period. I, I like to make an immediate waiver claim sometimes when I see mm. that. If I see a guy get cut Place and over. I'm like, oh, I, I, I want to remember this guy got cut, I'll put a waiver claim in for him and just like set him to drop my the bottom player on my roster. Mm. And then that way I know when I go back to look at waivers to actually do the waivers, I'm like, oh, right. If if I've forgotten, I'm yeah, like, oh, like a, right. This it's, like a yellow, it's like a yellow sticky on your roster exactly. page. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, uh, Yariel Rodriguez uh, for the Blue Jays made his debut. Uh, the Cuban pitcher, he threw two, three and two-thirds innings, allowed four hits, uh, one earned run, six strikeouts, um, walked two. It took him 68 pitches. He did not get out of the fourth inning. Um, he was a bit. He is one of the most added players, but I wanted to talk about him up in the front because it was a debut. 
Important to know about him that he didn't really take off as an international prospect until he was moved to the bullpen in Japan. Um, again, obviously, you saw here three and two thirds innings. Um, he threw fewer pitches in his second rehab start than he threw in his first rehab start. I, I just don't think this guy is a starter. I know that the Blue Jays have talked about using him, quote unquote, in length, but also as a starter, which seems to suggest he's not going to go five or six innings that often. I have no problem with you scooping him and keeping him on your bench and seeing, but but I'm just cautioning people against believing that this is going to be some some starter prospect who's going to you know come in and you know be a really good option for the Blue Jays. You know this is a, a 27 year old who was mainly a reliever abroad, and I think it'd be better if they used like an opener in front of him and then used him for for his fantasy value. Um, but I'm not running out to get him. I think he's solid, but you know. Don't go crazy. Yeah, the walk rate is a little bit concerning to me. And as you mentioned, he doesn't have – they don't look at him as probably a a guy who can start with any length, so you're never going to get any wins. Uh, He'll have to play his way onto my roster. Agreed. Uh, The White Sox are calling up Nick Nostrini, who is one of their top pitching prospects. They got him um, as part of the Lance Lynn deal from the Dodgers last year. Uh, Nostrini does not have good start uh, numbers through his AAA so far. It's only been two starts. He does miss a lot of bats. He does have a 27% strikeout minus walk rate in those um, two starts, but the ERA is obviously uh, not great. His best pitch is a four-seam fastball. It is only 93 miles per hour, um, but he does get decent extension on the pitch and a lot of induced vertical break. Keeps it up in the zone, so the pitch seems to rise, right? That's what we talk about. He also has a slider, changeup, and curveball. They're all basically just around average. So we have a slightly above average fastball, and we have a collection of uh, three breaking pitches or off-speed pitches that are about average. He does throw all four of them, so this is a little bit of like, you know, command and some of the parts over the individual pieces um, I think he's worth stashing in a, in deeper formats, but you know, we're talking about a guy who has, doesn't have overpowering stuff and is playing for potentially the worst team in baseball. So the amount of wins you're going to get is really low, but again, young player has some upside in deeper formats. Those type of pitchers can be at least rostered on your bench to see what you get. Yeah, I, I wish he had more of a minor league profile. His minor league career, 3.99 ERA, 1.22 whip. As you mentioned, the White Sox, I, I think the worst team in baseball, certainly the worst team in the American League. So how many games can you expect him to win? I, he's a he's a guy I'm interested to watch, but he's more of a watchless player for me. I, won't, I will not be first in line to add Nestrini, but he's certainly a name to know. Yeah, um, we talked about uh, Jake Berger, White Sox old team, Jake Berger, who was put on the I.L., or is being put on the IL today with an oblique strain. Uh, Berger himself said it feels like the oblique strain he had when he was with the White Sox that sidelined him for only 10 days. The expectation is that he's not going to miss that long. Um, he, you know, goes on your IL. Don't cut him right now because they don't think it's going to be a major injury. And the Marlins are calling up Otto Lopez. There's really nothing, nothing fantasy actionable there outside of NL only formats. God, I, I, you were so right when you talked about you want to attack this lineup. I mean, the second half of it just depresses the heck out of me. There's like three players here I want to roster. Yeah, Tim, Tim Anderson great. looks cooked. <laughs> I, I, I don't know. This is there are so many dead spots in this roster, and then it's a good place to pitch anyway. Yeah, for sure. Um, Christian Yelich also looks to be headed to the IL with a back injury. Um, they haven't yet placed him there. They're saying they're going to. So just that's something to keep an eye on. Yelich has obviously dealt with back injuries in the past. Um, it looks like it will be a decent amount of Blake Perkins in the outfield if Yelich does go on the IL. Um, Perkins is a switch hitter. Uh, there's also Joey Weimer who may get some starts against lefties. I think outside of deeper formats, there's nothing really actionable here. You're not cutting Yelich. You're holding on to him. Um, and then and per- and Perkins names- did so little last year in, in the 67-game right. sample. 217, 325, 350. I, mean, I know he was really good last week, but I, right. I, That's much, the- I yes. ignored it. That's the thing. Yes, he was really good in deeper formats. Sure, if he's going to get starts, you could put a little bit in. But this is a guy who was like, who's not hitting the ball really hard. The results are there, but the underlying metrics are saying don't don't go crazy. Um, Carlos Correa is on the IL. It was an oblique strain, and now it is an inter a slight intercostal strain. That's another way to say he strained his oblique. Um, we understand that oblique strains can sometimes linger, uh, so we don't know how long he'll be out for. There's no set timeline. 
Um, with Max Kepler also on the IL, it seems like all of Austin Martin, Willie Castro, and Kyle Farmer are going to play every day for the Twins in the in the immediate. Um, the Twins then become another offense that we should attack with pitchers. Are you interested in any of Austin Martin, Willie Castro, Kyle Farmer? Yeah, Castro, we've we've I feel like we've talked about him off and on. He covers a lot of positions. Last year mm-hmm. in 124 games, he had 33 stolen bases. He had in a very high success rate. He had nine home runs, so he's not powerless. Isn't this isn't funny though? We talked about the twins before the season. What we didn't like about them is it just looked like their roster, everybody was going to get hurt at some point, or at least a, a large percentage of their guys. And that's already come to roost with the expected Korea injury. And yeah, I mean, um, Kepler's a guy who's battled injuries. I feel like Kirilov is never far away from an injury. I say that with no joy because these are all talented players. I mean, Korea was seen as like on a Hall of Fame trajectory a couple of years ago. That mm-hmm. sounds laughable now, but. Um, Castro is at the front of the list for me, but I'm, this is a team I'm worried. And we talk about the AL central all the time. Go, go after these guys. The only is shockingly enough. The only lineup that's hitting right now in the AL central is the Royals. Uh, they're, they're a top 10 offense that everybody else is lagging behind, but I have no qualms throwing my pitchers against the twins. Yeah. Um, I also think in, um, in AL only tout in AL tout, I added Brooks Lee. Mm-hmm. Um, Brooks Lee is the, shortstop prospect for the twins um he would probably be up right now if he hadn't been battling his own injury he's set to return soon to the minor leagues but this is a guy where it's just like everybody thinks he's ready he needs a few more bats under his belt when he gets back from injury but he's a name we could hear about in in coming weeks so that's a name i want you to keep an eye on and then the last news and note piece with dominic canzone suffering a shoulder injury after running into the wall the mariners are calling up Jonathan Classe, um, who is their sixth ranked prospect, according to Fangraphs and MLB Pipeline. This is a guy who hit 20 home runs and stole 79 bases across high A and double A last year. He did have a 28% strikeout rate in 108 uh, games in double A. Um, was looking good at the start of the year in triple A, two home runs, three steals, Um 311 batting average had cut the strikeout rate to 22.6 percent but that is in just 12 games so we don't want to overreact but this is an interesting power speed guy in deeper formats where i feel like there is some playing time here for the mariners and we've talked about that mariners offense struggling a little bit to start the year um you know there there is a situation here where um you know if class a comes up and plays he could stick for sure. Uh, we know he can run. And some of the other things that may be missing from his game, he's 22 years old. I mean, he's he's a work in progress. He's a player who theoretically can get better. And by the way, if you're searching for him in your waiver wire list, make, sh- make sure you notice that the Jonathan is missing the H. It's J-O-N-A-T-A-N, mm-hmm. class A. So, you know, um, his parents had some fun with the birth certificate. But Seattle needs a spark of something. They need an extra expression of shot into this offense. And maybe class A can provide some of that. Yeah, uh, certainly can. We are going to run through uh, some of our most added and dropped hitters and pitchers. Uh, But before we do that, the countdown is on Wednesday is the 100 day mark to the Summer Olympics in Paris. Tune in this summer on NBC and Peacock to see the greatest athletes in the world go for the gold in the city of light. uh, Wednesday, the 100 day mark until Paris 2024. Um. I do love watching the Olympics. I'm not just being a company man here. Um, I do just the Olympics is great. Summer, winter doesn't matter to me. What's your favorite uh, Olympic sport? Uh, so we're talking summer or winter. I, I do love like all. I was a skier growing up, so I love all of the, like the the win- the downhill ski events, the the moguls, the slalom. Um, I love all that stuff. Summer, um, I like this. I like swimming and I like the track and field stuff. Um, uh, by far, my favorite Olympic sport is hockey because it's you just get world class competition. You, you get well, that's yeah, it's yeah. It, it's kind of apples and oranges, right? Because I think for the most part, I think Olympics is a chance to shine a light on sports that maybe aren't always in the, the public's eye. So, mm-hmm. you know, obviously, we went through the whole like Michael Phelps era where he was dominant and stuff. And, um, you know, we, we've seen some unbelievable track performances in the last 20 years or so. So that's always a, a highlight for me in the summer. But in the in the I, I do prefer the winter because the hockey's awesome. The skiing's fantastic. But sure. and I also like I don't know when they did this, mid 10, 15 years ago, something like that. But I like breaking it up 
where they they don't have the summer and winter in the same years. So you, you're only yeah. two years away from an Olympic cycle, no, which seems to make a lot more sense for planning purposes and everything. But uh, yeah, I love, I, I love it. I love yeah, interna it. International, I love international, international events are great. You know, I love the world cup. I, I love mm -hmm. an Olympic soccer is fantastic too, of course, but uh, yeah, I can't wait to watch some uh, summer Olympics on NBC. Yeah. And we're excited about some of these hitters. Uh, we're going to go hitters, then pitchers. We're going, most added and then most dropped. I'm going to combine them because we're going to try to go through this as quickly as possible. Uh, Colton Kowser was the most added hitter in Yahoo. We already spoke about him above. The second most added hitter was Michael Bush, um, who's now up to 60% rostered in Yahoo. He's homered in four straight games. He has five home runs with 11 RBIs and a 327 average. We've talked about him on the show before. We don't need to belabor the point. You should be adding Michael Bush. He's playing every day for the Cubs. I don't expect the batting average to stay this high, but you should definitely be adding him. Um, a trio of outfielders uh, brings up the next most added. It was Jerickson Profar, um, who's still only 19% rostered um, in Yahoo Leagues. Brandon Marsh, who's up to 39% rostered in Yahoo Leagues. Um, and Nelson Velasquez of the Royals, who's up to 20% rostered in Yahoo Leagues. Uh, Profar, probably the best of the bunch in terms of stats right now, is hitting 321 with two home runs. Uh, seven runs scored and 13 RBIs while playing pretty much every day for the Padres. Uh, though Brandon Marsh is also having a really great start to the year. 13, uh, 313 batting average with four home runs, seven runs scored, nine RBIs, uh, one stolen base. He is striking out nearly 40% of the time as he is trading contact for power. That's why we see the power early on. Um, of these three guys, are you interested in any of them? Does anybody jump out to you? It's. I'm trying to break a tie between Marsh and Profar. They're so different, right? I mean, Profar, back nine player. He was the number one prospect, not a prospect, the number one prospect in baseball once upon a time. He had injury problems. He bounced. He's played all over the field. He's gone to different teams. And I feel like I've written so many, oh, this is the year for Jerks and Profar. And it, it never has been the year for Jerks and Profar. Right. Now, on the flip side, Brandon Marsh, with that walk strikeout rate, you can't take the 313 average with any level of no. seriousness. But as you said, he's trading it for power. And he had 125 OPS plus last year. He was a good offensive player. And I, I realize with uh, with him being a lefty hitter, he may not play every day. But as long as he's on the strong side of a platoon and picks up some mm -hmm. at bats in the days he doesn't and, start, that's fine. And he's playing mostly against against left-handed pitching, too. They've, they've been keeping Marsh in the lineup and platooning some other guys, which makes him a little more interesting to me as well. So because Marsh is five years younger, and because I, I could see Marsh hitting 20 home runs, Profar's not. I mean, Profar did have a couple of 20 home run seasons you know, a long time ago with Texas and Oakland, but I feel like Profar, like last year, he was, what, a 236, 316, 364 player? I mean, I don't know. I, I guess those were his Colorado stats. He was a little bit better for San Diego, but... I, I want to go Marsh because he's younger, and I think mm -hmm. the home runs are more portable here. He's not going to hit yeah. over 300, but I think he could hit 265, 270, which would be fine. Also, uh, probably better lineup real estate. Profar may end up being somebody who still sticks in the bottom third of the San Diego lineup. Um, and I, I would also be adding Profar in deeper formats because he is producing and hitting in that lineup. I would prioritize Marsh, and then I would just say if you are if you need strictly power – I still think Nelson Velasquez of the three is the one that's going to get you the power. He looked great coming over in the trade. No, he's not going to hit over 300. That BABIP is super inflated right now, but he he is going to hit for power and is playing pretty much every day in that Kansas City lineup. Um, another player playing every day in the Kansas City lineup who was one of the most dropped players in Yahoo formats was Michael Garcia. Don't do it, people. Don't drop Michael Garcia. Um, I, it just doesn't make sense. I understand that he had a really hot like first week of the season. Um, and now you're like, well, he's only hitting 182. L sure. But he's hit three home runs. He's stolen three bases. There's nothing in the underlying metrics that suggests that he's um, earning the 182 batting average. Um, in fact, it comes with a 191 BABIP. He's barreling the ball way more than he's ever had. Um, this is one of the things that Scott and I talked about before. This is one of my like, this is, I'm not panicking on a player like this. This is a um, pick, him, pick him up if he's cut, trade for him if you can. His expected batting average is 251. Most of his sliders on Savant are on the right-hand side, the good side. This is a total fluke. And remember, last year, the only thing that was wrong with him, because 272 is a great average, and we love the stolen bases, he didn't show power. This mm -hmm. year, he's showing power. He's got an unlucky batting average. It's a total fluke. Strong buy on Garcia. Yeah, agreed. Um, 
Another flip side of it, one of the most dropped players was Connor Joe, who's gone down now to just 48% rostered. This is an example for me of not overreacting to early starts. Connor Joe looked great to start the year. If you looked at it, you saw the Pirates faced five lefties to start the year and faced like seven lefties in their first 11 starts. That's when Connor Joe plays a lot. He was playing a lot. He was hitting really well. It has settled in now where to where he's looking more like regular Connor Joe. Um, so this is the don't overreact to those early small samples. Yeah, he's, a, uh, he's a really an average Joe. I, I'm actually thrilled to have him in NL tout where you don't mind if somebody plays two or three times sure. a week. He will not play enough to be relevant in mixed leagues. Yeah. Uh, last hitter, and then we'll we'll do some real quick pitchers before you got to get out of here. Um, Sedan Rafael is one of the most dropped players in Yahoo leagues. He's hitting 163 with a 483 OPS for the Red Sox. However, he's playing basically every day. He's starting at shortstop today in Patriots Day, and Alex Cora said that's because they want to get William Abreu in the lineup. He said William Abreu is going to play against all righties, which would seem to indicate that Rafaela could play shortstop against all righties. So we could be looking at shortstop outfield eligibility. My question to you is just with, with rookies like this, who we know are, you know, really well-regarded prospects. When do you start to worry? There seems to be a long enough leash here with Rafaela where he's going to keep playing. Are you worried about cutting him and having him figure it out? Would you rather just keep him on your bench? Well, they signed him to an extension, right? I mean, I, yeah, an eight year that, extension. There you go. I mean, he's going to play, and they know this team is all about, they're not going to say this up, up front, but they're, they're trying to figure out what their team's going to look like the next two or three years. So mm -hmm. the playing time is fine. The defense is good, although I'm curious to see how he projects as a shortstop, but I would certainly give him a fair amount of leash. Yeah, I, I say this all the time with prospects like this. This is one of those things where, like, I, I'm going to wait until May unless I really, really, really have to move on because. Guys who I think are going to play every day, prospects who I think are going to play every day, we have to assume a little bit of a learning curve. And if you drafted a prospect, you can't cut him when they struggle for three weeks. That's not that that's that is placing unfair expectations on a player that you drafted. If you're churning guys on the waiver wire and it's a prospect, fine. But when you draft guys like you know Rafaela or Jackson Holiday or or Churio, right? They're not all going to hit the ground running immediately. And that doesn't change who they are as prospects. So hold on. Uh, we're going to end with some quick thoughts on some pitchers that are added and dropped. But before we do that, can Nellie Corda continue her hot start and fend off the LPGA's finest at the Chevron Championship? Tune in this week for the first major of the season uh, only on NBC and Peacock, the LPGA Chevron Championship. Again, only on NBC and Peacock. And I, I would bet on quarter because it's been the month of favorites, Connecticut, South Carolina, Scotty Scheffler at the masters. Uh, it's a, uh, it's a good, a good time to bet on shock, a good time to, uh, to watch him Nelly quarter this weekend. Yeah. Um, quick hitters on some pitchers because I want to make sure we spend uh, a lot of our time talking about pitching about this, these interesting closer situations. Uh, the most added, the four most added pitchers are all starters um, who looked pretty good this week and have solid matchups. It's Seth Lugo, who's now up to 47% rostered. Javier Assad of the Cubs, who's now up to 35% rostered. Mackenzie Gore, who's up to 51%. And Nicola Dolo, who returned and looked really good against the White Sox and is up to 66%. I think you and I both would say that Lodolo is the guy we'd prioritize the most because of the track record and the upside. Um, are you interested in any of the other three? Personally, I think Mackenzie Gore looks really good. The new fastball shape and the fastball usage has been great. He should be rostered in way more than 51% of leagues. Um, and I also like what Assad and Lugo are doing. Um, Lugo gets the White Sox and the Orioles today in, in a two-start. The White Sox today and the Orioles next weekend as part of a two-start week, which is why he was added a lot. Um, and Javier Assad, Assad gets the Marlins over the weekend. I I'd be adding all four of these guys. Me too, and and the order you or listed them as well. Although Gore versus Lodolo would be a choice for me, I think Gore's upside is just as high as Lodolo's. Is remember Gore was the key part of that Soto trade. The thing with Assad is he's pitched well, and you think, well, guys are coming back, but eventually somebody slumps or somebody gets hurt. If he pitches well, they'll make room for him in the rotation. So I was more proactive with him in free agency this weekend than mm -hmm. maybe some people may be. But there are four names that certainly that 
Gore should be like 70% rostered. Right. I think it's not should be close to like 45 or 50. Um, and even Ladola, he'll probably push up to 80%. You have to deal yeah. with the Cincinnati park, but you name the, the right guys. Those are certainly the pitchers that I was bidding on this week. Although Gore was taken Gore's on a lot of my rosters already. Right. And, and Lugo doesn't get enough love. I love Lugo as a, especially in forever in underrated. He's great, but he is just a really solid pitcher. And maybe the Royals, you know, we talked about that, that division is there to be stolen. Right. And I, I, I was, I was picking the Tigers to be that team. Why can't the Royals be that team? That's true. Uh, one of the most added relievers was Michael, Michael Kopech, uh, who's now just 41% rostered. Um, I wrote about him, uh, and did a video about him. I think he should be rostered in almost all leagues. Yes. He might not get a lot of saves on the white Sox, but you know, maybe he gets 10 plus they've used him in multiple innings. Sometimes he's throwing 101. He's got a good slider. This is a guy who could be, you know, a lighter version of Mason Miller. Cause I think Mason Miller is actually going to get more saves. Um, but I think it's the same type of like, Hey, really good stuff could go multiple innings. Team isn't great, but can help you in ratios and strikeouts. Out of I'm so glad you mentioned Mason Miller, by the way, because he's my favorite reliever to watch in baseball right now. When so he, good. He, he throws a fastball in the zone that you can't hit, and then he starts throwing the breaking stuff that you can't even get close to. He is yeah. – I just please don't get hurt, Mason Miller. But uh, Kopech is kind of like the poor man's Mason Miller right now. They're both on bad teams. They both throw – ridiculously hard i think miller's upside is a lot higher and who knows maybe he'll eventually be a starter but i'll sign off on kopech and even the bad teams can support a 15 to 25 save closer agreed uh just some quick notes uh tristan mckenzie is one of the most dropped starting pitchers he's in rostered in 68 percent of leagues i agreed with everything you said at the start of the show i'm really worried about him velocity he doesn't look right i have him in al tout I'm holding him because it's an AL only league. I would be dropping him in other places. And Hunter Brown was also uh, one of the most dropped starting pitchers. He's rostered in just 56% of leagues. I'd be trying to hold on to Hunter Brown where I can because I do believe in the baseline of talent. But he gets Atlanta and, and the Cubs in his next two starts. It's hard to start him there. So I understand if you're not going to pitch him for three weeks, you might decide to look for something else in shallower formats how could you trust him after that nine run inning against the royals again kansas City's playing well right now but still i think hunter brown's one bad start away from going to the minors it, it's entirely possible and we talked about how you know guys are are coming back um so they have that uh one of the most dropped relievers pairs up with one of the most added relievers jose leclerc is now down to 60 percent rostered um David Robertson is already rostered in a lot of leagues, 45% of leagues, but Kirby Yates was one of the most added relievers. 12% of, is now up to just 12% rostered, but added a lot over the weekend. I think LeClerc is done. Um, you know, you and I have mentioned that many times. We've talked about all three of these guys many times. I think we both believe in Robertson and to a lesser extent Yates as um, stashes. So anything to add? First of all, I would drop Leclerc. I know we all want saves. He pitched in the fifth or sixth inning over the weekend. They they won the World Series last year. They're not going to mess around. They're, this isn't like some bad team that's trying to get a closer to get some saves to trade them later. They have other guys they trust. Now, Robertson, I do think the roster tags on Robertson and Yates should be closer together. Remember, Yates and, and Bochi have a history together. Not that Robinson couldn't be the closer, but and sometimes just the first guy to get a couple of saves takes the job and runs with it. I have shares of both of these guys. The biggest thing I can say is I don't trust Jose Leclerc at all. Even if you're just adding speculative guy, a guy in the minors, a guy who's hurt coming back, just drop Jose Leclerc for anything. I slightly favor Robertson over Yates, but it's close to me. Yeah, and then uh, one the one last thing to take us out. These two uh, two other relievers are the most dropped um, in Yahoo leagues. It was Abner Uribe on the Brewers. He pitched in the seventh inning the other day, and he pitched against the eight nine one batters, so it wasn't even the middle of the order. Um, Trevor McGill, who we talked about um, liking early in the year, who is on the concussion IL, is beginning a rehab assignment, so he's coming back soon. And then Tanner Scott, another implosion. Um, with the Marlins, he's 79% rostered, but is one of the most dropped relievers. Um, there's some speculation on Andrew Nardi, who's 5% rostered, uh, or AJ Puck uh, with Edward Cabrera coming back. AJ Puck could move to the bullpen. Um, do you have any hope for either Abner Uribe or Tanner Scott? Are you holding on? Are you dropping? Who are you adding? What are you doing in these situations? Yeah, threat level is 10 at with Uribe. It's like 7 or 8 on Scott. I, I would cut Uribe right now, and I would be proactive cutting Scott as well. And I I'd love to see. I know Puck had the great spring training. It didn't translate to the early starts, but he's been effective as a reliever before. I'm really curious to see what he does if he gets percolating back to that spot. 
Yeah, I would I would keep an eye on Puck, and I would also keep an eye on Nardi. I know you know Greg Jewett over at Reliever Recon likes Nardi. Nardi has had I had a rough really a rough start to the year, had settled, then did allow um uh you know I had a poor outing against the Braves, but it's the Braves. It's just a little bit of a mess there. Um. Uh, and I I like specking on McGill when he comes back for the Brewers, but I think the Brewers said they're going to mix and match. They will until Devin Williams returns. And they they um, still think Williams is coming back in the middle of the season. And I know a lot right. of times that's wish casting, but maybe with a back injury, it might not be. I, I think right. Williams is going to pitch a decent chunk of time this year. So who knows? Maybe there's not not much gold to be found in Milwaukee anyway. Yeah, and and Milwaukee's doing well right now, so they're they're going to want to get him back if they can. Um, so that's going to do it for our waiver wire discussion. Um, if you want to reach out to Scott and I, you can on Twitter. You can find me at Samsky NYC. Scott is at Scott underscore Pianowski. Um, we'll be back on Wednesday. We're going to look at some pit starting pitchers strikeout risers and let you know who we believe in and who we don't. Um, so check us out on the next episode of the Roto World Baseball Show.